and we're going to talk about high marks from Jesus. You've all taken a test. You've all taken tests in your life. You've taken driver's tests or you've taken you know, graduate tests in college or universities or high school or wherever. Jesus says that Christians will be bearing fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Matthew 13, 8. The seed fell on good ground and yielded crop, some 100-fold, some 60-fold, some 30. Then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What, what's the thinking there? Anybody, any, anybody you know, well, I shouldn't say it that way. Right? Pretty much everybody you know has ears. Right? If we met a person who had no ears, like they just grew with no ears, it'd be like, ooh, what happened there? Right? It'd be very strange. Right? And sadly it happens, I guess, to some people. But what is he saying? If you have ears to hear, what's, what's the meaning? What's the thinking behind that verse? Open your ears. The what? When we say open your ears, yeah, Jesus is saying, listen up, open your, open your ear. If you want to hear what I, Jesus, am saying, then open up your ears and listen to what I'm saying. Look for the thinking of what I'm saying, right? So, in another place, Jesus said this to the crowd in Matthew 15, 10, hear and understand. So, he doesn't just say, you've got ears, so listen. He said, I want you to listen, but I want you to listen with getting the understanding. And that's, that's where two billion Jesus-following people are missing the boat. They hear words from the Bible. They are given an understanding that's not true, so they're hearing a true word out of the Bible. They're given a mixed-in erroneous understanding of that word. And now they've got bread that's mixed with leaven. They've got spiritual leavened products, which is mixed with error, and so they believe error. Matthew 13, 23, Jesus expands, expands on this parable of the sower, and he says, He who received the seed on good ground is he who hears the word. Now, when people read their Bibles... If you're reading your Bible to a five-year-old or you and the teenagers are having a Bible study, you're reading the words. This is upside down. I can't read it because it's upside down. I should be able to read it. I'm an Australian, right? So if you're reading the word to a teenager, they're hearing the word. And except for a few small, poorly translated sections, they're hearing what God said, right? So he's saying they hear the word and they understand it. And there's a huge difference between the two. Passover, you, you, you could ask a lot of people, is, is Passover to be kept by New Testament Christians? And a lot of those people would say, no, it's Old Jewish, it's Old Testament, it's not needed for New Testament Christians. And then you say, well, Paul was teaching New Testament Christians in Corinth, and he said, keep the Passover. Well, <laughs> that don't matter, right? They don't want to know the understanding of what's actually in the book. So you have to hear the word, you have to understand the word, right? He, he bears fruit and produces some 100-fold, 60-fold, and 30-fold. Most Jesus people never hear Jesus' teaching about Passover and unleavened bread. Joel Oldstein, anybody heard? Now, somebody said he, he mentions it, but he doesn't explain it. Right? It's like, oh, it's part of the Old Testament. They did it. Well, that's no help. You should do it. He's not saying you should do it. He might mention it and they did it. Right? So... The more we understand Christ's words and practice Christ's words, the more fruit we bear. The more fruit we produce, the greater our reward from Jesus. Now, 
from all my listening to Christian radio throughout the years, I very seldom hear how big is your reward going to be in the next life. All I hear is, I just want to get to heaven. I just want to live forever. I don't care if I don't get a reward. Well, you could say that now, but when you're standing in the kingdom and you have no reward and everybody else has a reward, how are you going to feel? <laughs> you go, oh, I could have had a V8. Oh, what was the matter with me? Why didn't I pay attention, right? So the more we understand Christ's words and practice them, the more fruit we bear, the greater our reward in heaven. Jesus showed this principle in Luke 19, 13. So he called 10 of his servants and he delivered to them 10 miners, a, a kind of value money, right? And he said to them, do business till I come. Like, work for me, bear fruit, gain, increase. Verse 15, when he returned, he called them that he might know how much every man had gained, increased by trading. Verse 16, then came the first one and said, Master, your miner has earned 10 miners. If I gave you $10 and you went away and you traded with it and you came back with $100, whoo, that's a 10 times increase. That's big, right? And Jesus said to him, Well done, good servant, because you are faithful in very little. Have authority over ten cities full of people. Has anybody here ever been a mayor of a city? That's a big responsibility. He's saying you're going to be king over ten cities. That's a huge amount of responsibility. Right? And the next guy came and he said, your miner has earned five miners. And he said, great, you get five cities. So the first guy, ten times, ten cities. The second guy, five times bigger, he got five cities. And that's all Jesus says on that subject, like Forrest Gump. That's all I'm going to say. Right? And so, so but, but the principle is there. The principle is you're going to have different kinds of rewards dependent upon how much effort you put into being like Christ, to serving. So it appears that Jesus is saying double the effort gets double the reward. Now, <clears throat> I, you know, I don't know what my reward is going to be. But I want it to be something. And everybody here should be wanting, I want some reward. Why? Well, because I love Jesus and I want to serve Jesus. And so in serving Jesus, he says that generates rewards. So if I don't serve Jesus very much, then I don't get a reward or I don't get much of a reward. So I want to serve Jesus as much as I can to earn as much reward as I can. Right? And Jesus will figure out what kind of reward I need. I might get one city. I don't know. Right? But, but the, the eternal life is a gift. You can't earn eternal life. The rewards is what you earn. And we're here now on this life earning rewards. So he wants to, Jesus wants to know he's bringing his rewards for us with him when he lands back on planet Earth in a couple of more years, right? I'm, I'm guessing somewhere between five and ten years from now, his feet will be on the planet, will be into the kingdom, and all of this lawlessness and crazy insanity you see around you will stop because the creator of the universe says stop right? and we'll start living like sane people on planet earth for a change he says matthew 16 27 for the son of man will come and his angels and he will reward each one according to his works whatever you did as far as service for jesus christ that's what your reward is based on the last chapter of the Bible repeats this as part of God's plan. Revelation 22, 12, finishing up the last book, the last chapter of the last book of the Bible. This is how it finishes. And he says, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward for each person is with me to give to everyone according to his works, according to whatever it was that he did or she did. We will be given freely the gift of eternal life. We can't earn it. And also we will be rewarded as the second tier of this according to our efforts to bear fruit for God. 
Four beautiful verses in John 15 show what Jesus expects from every Christian. And, and these four verses are worthy of think it through slowly, right? John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Now when he says, I am the vine, what does that mean? Anybody seen a grapevine? Anybody ever been to a vineyard and seen a grapevine? Right? Okay. I, I, was, I was out working on a vineyard and helping trim grapevines. But anyhow, the, the root system comes out of the ground. No surprise there. And then it comes up and then you run it along all the wires and the, all the branches come off the root system. Jesus is our root system spiritually. Last night at Passover, we went back to our root system, right? I am the vine. I am your root system, says Jesus. And you, church members, are the branches, right? And we go be, grow because we're connected to Jesus. And we've got a year ahead of us until next Passover. We need to be connected to Jesus. He says, if you abide in me, we don't use the word abide very much, right? It means function in Jesus' thinking. If you're, if you're operating, right? If your if you're anti, anti-lock brake system is working, it'll do certain things for you. I love these new cars that if you're about to run into something, they, they slam on your brakes. I, I gotta get me one of those. <laughs> you know, that's a wonderful vehicle. It's like, you mean if I drive at that that brick wall at 50 miles an hour, it'll stop me? Yeah, give it a try. <laughs> it's amazing technology. Anyhow, so um, there's, there's a Passover theme in this verse 5, and that is, I am the root system. You need to function in my thinking. Do the Passover, for one thing, and then live the Passover theme for the rest of the year. Each year, at the, whole, at the commanded Holy Passover meeting, we reconnect to Christ's sacrificial death, which is the root system for growing into eternal life. At Passover, we are saying to Jesus, I will live by your teachings for one more year until next Passover. Then Jesus warns his servant about jumping ship. Right? That's, you know, he gives you a balanced view of Christianity. Verse 6 of John 15. If anyone does not abide in me, if you don't stay functioning in me, if you're not obeying me, if you're not doing what I'm telling you to do, he is cast out like a branch and he's withered. He's talking about church members. Withered church members, right? And they gather them and they throw them into the fire and they are burned. Now this is the Revelation 21 verse 8 lake of fire burning at the second death, right? Where he says, verse 8, the cowardly and the unbelieving now, if you turn away from Christ, you become unbelieving. You no longer trust and believe in what Jesus is saying and doing. And they will have their part in the, in the lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, which is dead for all eternity, because you didn't want to be part of the God family through Jesus Christ, the root system. Okay, back to John 15, 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, if my teachings, my thinking are functional inside of your brain, right? You will ask what you want, what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Now, if you read that with human thinking only, you go, ah, that ain't going to work. I want a Cadillac. God, give me a Cadillac. And you don't get a Cadillac. It doesn't work. It's a non-functioning system, right? And you could prove it. You could, you know, a bunch of guys drinking at a bar. They could say, well, I'll just prove that scripture is wrong. I'll just ask God, hey, God, I'll text him. I'll write him a letter and I'll send it to Santa Claus and Santa Claus can send it on to God, right? I, I'm asking for a Cadillac. Deliver it next Wednesday, please. <laughs> okay. But if you're abiding in the thinking of Christ, you start desiring and asking for things that are according to the will of God. And then you get them. And if you're asking for eternal life, and you keep asking for eternal life and living according to his teaching, you're going to get what you're asking for. So, 
Verse 7 reflects the major understanding of the Unleavened Bread Festival, that of hungering to know Christ better, on the one hand, growing in the knowledge of Christ, in true knowledge, and on the other hand, rejecting the religious commandments of men. Now, if you've been a Baptist, they had a set of commandments. If you've been a Catholic, they had a set of commandments. In whatever religious grouping you were in, they had a set of commandments, right? <coughs> Some of which were based on the Bible and others were not. The Baptists, at least I think, have the commandment if you're not supposed to drink alcohol, right? And then they make jokes about Baptists drinking alcohol, right? But Jesus drank wine. Oh, wine is alcohol, right? So the Bible teaches don't get drunk. If you never drink alcohol, you can't get drunk. So it says drink wine, but don't get drunk. So there's a balance. All right, Paul and Jesus teach new Gentile converts to Christianity that they must keep the unleavened bread festival. Now, two billion Jesus following people will say to me, Ian, you're wrong. That's not in the Bible. And I would say, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Right? Let us therefore keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Oh, well, he didn't mean that. <laughs> right? People are not wanting to know the true thinking, the true unmixed truth, of what Jesus teaches through Paul in this case, right? So let us keep the feast, festival of unleavened bread, not with old leaven, right? Or the leaven of malice and wickedness. What, what is the leaven of mal malice and wickedness? When you make a loaf of bread, do you get a little shaker that says leaven of malice and you put that in the mixture and here's, here's leaven of wickedness and you put that in the mixture and mix it all together and you bake it up and there's a loaf of bread with malice and wickedness inside the loaf of bread. It's a spiritual understanding. He says, but with the unleavened bread, and that word sincerity, in the RSV Bible, right, um, it, it can be translated unmixedness. And you probably have never heard the word unmixedness. But you can figure out what it means. It means... You didn't mix anything else into it. So you have truth with nothing mixed into it. Now when you make leavened bread, you make bread and you mix into bread leaven. And you get puffed up bread, right? So he says, you know, with the unleavened bread of unmixedness or sincerity and truth. Truth without any mixture added to it. Now, how much rat poison would you have to eat on a daily basis to die in 10 years? Hopefully none of you know the answer to that, right? But a little bit of rat poison may or may not hurt you. Depends what else you eat, I guess. I don't know. But a good, good helping of rat poison is probably going to kill you pretty quick. Right? It's a bad mixture. And that's what two billion people have today that follow Jesus Christ half-heartedly with a mixture of truth out of the Bible and the commandments of men mixed in. And they're not looking for the true teaching of Jesus Christ and the true thinking. John 10, 4. He goes before them and, he, and his sheep follow him because his sheep know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee. They run away from people who teach error. For they do not know the voice of strangers who teach error, who are Jesus' teachers. So one of the most important things any new convert to Christianity can learn is, beware of Jesus' teachers, <laughs> which seems to be insanity. Because wait, that's how I'm going to learn from Jesus. Well, there's actually a better way. The better way is, pray, God, I'm going to read your word. Please help me understand it. All right, John 3, 13. 
No man has ascended into heaven. Um, can that possibly be true? How can that possibly be true? Two billion people believe you go to heaven when you die. Let me read it again. John 3.13 No man has ascended into heaven except Jesus. All right, God, cancel that prayer. I don't want to know. <laughs> so studying the Bible between you and God in prayer is a great way to learn pure truth without mixed in commandments of men. But most people are lazy. I'm lazy. Is there anybody here lazy? Am I the only lazy person? Put your hand up if you're lazy. I am lazy. Ah, oh, I'm terrible at being lazy. But I'm trying to overcome it. So I keep working at it. She is, I'm not. Okay, that's, well, that's good to know. It's good to have some truth in here. That's good. <laughs> Paul shows that each person can choose the quality of their fruitfulness. That's interesting. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3.12. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation, talking about Jesus, gold, silver, or precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble, or, or straw, right? Now, what are you doing, Paul? You're saying build something out of gold? That's kind of expensive. Plywood's expensive now anymore, right? Okay. Silver? Well, that's a good building material. Precious stones, yeah. Why would you build something out of wood, hay, and stubble if you know it's going to be revealed or tested by fire? Right? Because that's the next verse. Each one works, work will become clear for the day will declare it because it will be revealed, tested by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. Oh, so my Christian life is to be built and then tested by fire. And I can choose to build it out of hay, wood or stubble. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm going to choose those materials. But we don't, we don't, there's no chapter in your Bible that says the build from wood chapter. This is how you build towards Jesus using wood. There's no chapter for that. So you have to figure out, is what I'm building based on pure truth, unmixed with error, or is it mixed with error? I need to know. Paul and Peter speak of fiery trials that beset Christian lives. Ephesians 6.16, you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. They are going to be fiery temptations. 1 Peter 4.12 Do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you <clears throat> as something strange has happened to you. Christians should expect to be tested and tried and have fiery trials. It just goes with the territory. Because a lot of people don't like Christians. There are Christians who don't like Christians. <laughs> right? So you can get yourself into trouble being too Christian in somebody's presence. Jesus shows that some of the trials beset Christians, and he shows it in Matthew 13, 22. He who received the seed among the thorns is he, let's see, is he who hears the word. Okay, when, when he read, hears the word, Jesus means... Here's the word with understanding. Not just, here's somebody read John 3, 16, right? Okay, he hears the word, and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word out of this person, and they become unfruitful. They heard the word and they became fruitful, and then later... The cares of the world, of which everyone experiences, and the, and the riches, you know, the, the deceitfulness of riches, I want to get rich, or I don't want to spend that money right, to go to the Feast of Tabernacles, or whatever it is, right? Choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. He stops bearing fruit for Jesus. Each year, God calls true believers to Passover. Do what I say for Passover, says Jesus. He calls them to the Unleavened Bread Festival. Do what I say for the Unleavened Bread Festival. And he calls them for the Festival of Weeks to re-energize 
outgrowing more fruitful for another 12 months. It's on a 12 month basic cycle. Passover draws us back to our foundation and the covenant agreement we made with Jesus at our baptism. Unleavened bread reminds us to be asking for our daily bread nutrition and to help us avoid erroneous truths and teachings. They're not truths, erroneous teachings mixed in with true truth. So, you know, give me truth, keep the error. I don't want your error, I just want the truth. The Festival of Weeks, the third one, tells us to avoid spiritual dehydration. Keep on drinking of the Spirit of God from Jesus by drinking frequently of God's Holy Spirit. By these three, we can grow strong and bear much quality fruit for Jesus. And then we can be certain of getting high marks from Jesus.